Hello, this reflection is based on the book of the Acts of the Apostle, chapter 1, verses 6 to 14. You probably notice that when we hear a tragedy, just it or world, well, our initial impulse is to, it's often to turn on the TV and watch uh, CNN, Fox News, uh, CBC News Network, or your, pre your favorite uh, channel. The, tra the tragedy might have been over for the last four to five hours, and yet we keep watching. They may go to a reporter on site who is repeating exactly word for word what has been said 15 minutes previously, they might keep showing the same two-minute clip in a loop over and again. They might tell us they don't know exactly what's going on, and yet we keep watching. Sometimes we're not even sure why we are glued to our screen. And, and we know from experience that nothing else will happen, and most likely no significant information will come soon, and yet, we're still watching. It's human nature. The beginning of the Acts of the Apostles somehow feels that way. You probably already know that this biblical book was written by the same author of the Gospel according to Luke. In today's terms, we could call it a sequel or the second installment of a new franchise. The book of Acts opened with the short reminder that the previous book was all about what Jesus did and taught during his life, followed by an account of his passion, death, and resurrection. Beginning with the sixth verse of the first chapter, where our text begins this morning, the author desires to address the episode when Jesus was taken up in heaven, an event also known as his ascension. In Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches, the ascension of Jesus tend to be an important festival, highlighting Christ's glory and power. However, for most mainline Protestants these days, like people of the United Church, for example, Jesus' ascension is a, it's a probably, problematic story, to say the least. It's hard sell. It might have been believable a few centuries ago, but today, we know better. Like, come on. Resurrection is already difficult to swallow. To, for modern, modern minds because we're told that Jesus was unequivocally dead. Dead. And he came back to life three days later. This is not how biology works, and yet since it's such a central point in our religion, we're ready to go with it. But ascension? Are we to believe that Jesus began to fly like a bird? Was he beam up like in Star Trek? Did he finish his ministry on Earth as a rocket rising a few hundred miles above the planet? And where is he supposed to be now? Is Jesus floating in space with satellites? Nah, it does not make sense, eh? So why are we keeping this story? Well, this old confusing story most likely did not make much sense for Jesus' disciple either. After the resurrection of their master, after appearing to many for 40 days, after giving them numerous convincing proof that it was really him, well, the disciples surely thought that this was finally the time when Jesus would restore the kingdom of Israel, when this new realm of God would re arrive. But no, once again, 
Jesus is leaving them. And it certainly felt odd. Like if one disciple showed up and said to honor, Hey, my friend, I have good news and bad news for you. Which one do you want first? Well, let's begin with the bad news. Well, Jesus is gone. He's not among us anymore. Okay, what's the good news? There's no good news. He is gone. Okay, did he say something like when he will come back? Not really. We don't have a clue. Well, if he's up there, maybe if we look up long enough, we'll see him. Something will happen. We'll see his kingdom. We'll... Oh, oh! Nope, never mind. That's a bird. So, let us stay here and continue to watch. <laughs> the disciple will probably still standing and gazing up toward heaven as I speak. If two men in white robe, most likely angels, stood by them and wonder, why are you looking up? Well, it's Jesus. He's up there. We're waiting for his return. <laughs> the angel said, my friends from Galilee, don't you have something else to do? Well, we don't know, probably replied the disciple. Jesus used to tell us what to do. Now he's gone, up there. <laughs> and the angel told them, did you not pay attention to what he said just a few moments ago? He said, go to Jerusalem and wait over there. And yet you are standing at the same place. Stop looking at the sky and just go. This apparent simple decision for an action was most likely the biggest change in the lives of the disciple, probably more important than the day of Pentecost itself. Because you see, up to this point, all their lives revolve around Jesus. He was the one who healed the sick, fed the people, forgave sins, preached about the promise of a new world based on new values and principle, and during all these years, the disciple progressively understood who Jesus was, and some of them even discover a little more about themselves through this relationship. But Christ's ascension definitely marks the end of an era and the beginning of a new chapter in, history, in the history of the Church of God. Jesus of Nazareth is no longer the main character of the story. He's gone. Now it's up to the disciple to make sure their movement, the revolution they began, continues. Not up there, but here. They have to make their first decision by themselves. They have to choose between looking at heaven and going back to Jerusalem. And this without Jesus' explicit direction. Historically, Christianity has spent a large amount of time and energy on topics like uh, systematic theology, the concept of Trinity, describing and researching what might be the afterlife. And all of this is not necessarily wrong in itself. But these concepts mean little if they're not connected with the reality of the world that surrounds us. Of course, of course, the promises of a beautiful, heavenly, and everlasting life might be more attractive than the daily reality of our ugly and perfect and broken world. Yes. Still, like it or not, 
we live down here. This is where we are. This is where our brothers and sisters need our help. This is where those who are oppressed require our support. This is where those who are rejected by our society long for compassion and acceptance. This is where those who are afraid search for a calming presence. This is where the poor and hungry have to be fed. This is the world where our ministries have to be done. And today, we are the successor of the first disciple. And since Christ did not come back in full glory, well, it's up to us to do something and to be active in our world. The kingdom of God, the new realm Jesus came to announce, is now our mission. And since it will not magically appear by itself, it's our call to make it happen. This means we're asked to be involved, to use the numerous gifts we receive, to be brave, to be courageous, to act, even if it's scary at first, even if we're not sure we're doing it right, even if we have never done it before. We are invited to be generous and bold as Jesus taught us, we are called to stop standing and looking up for something up there and to go where we are needed the most. It's always safer and less demanding for sure to be a spectator than someone involved in a world. As disciples of Jesus the Christ, we are not called to stare at some reality over and again, expecting something that may never come anyway, but to act, to try, to undertake new projects, and to dare to be the Church of God, even in this time of pandemic. Instead of passively waiting for Jesus to come back and fix everything for us, we can all actively participate in the work that needs to be done today. Jesus is gone. It's up to us to make a difference, not over there, but down here right now. Thanks be to God. Thank you for being there. And Amen.